Amen, amen. Ratasha is just one of the awesome staff members we have here at Eastview Christian Church. I hope you get to know her sometime, but she is fantastic, and I love that she shares her story. And we're all in this game, I mean, we're all in this, this thing called invitation. The kingdom of God is dependent on being invited. In fact, if you're a member here, somebody invited you here uh, way back in the day, even if it was your parents saying you're going to church, that was your invitation when you were a little kid. So family of Eastview, so glad you're here. Maybe some, some of you here today have been invited for the very first time. We're glad you're here. Maybe you've been coming for a little bit. Uh, it's an invitation that got you here, but we want to invite you deeper into our family. If you're watching us online today, we just want to say welcome. Maybe somebody invited you to watch online today. I hope that's the case. And come closer if you can. We want you to be, we invite you into this thing called Eastview Christian Church. I want to say hi to, to Peg and Bill from Jinx, Oklahoma, from Andy and Jillian from Normal, and from uh, Ann from Surprise, Surprise, Arizona, and uh, Pam and Steve from Lake Geneva, and Chad and Sheila from Fair Oaks, Indiana. God bless you all, all of you that are watching with us today. We're glad you're here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. I hope you have your Bibles with you. It's very important. Um, but we've dressed like we're going to a wedding today because the story that we're going to look at, this 2,000-year-old story from Jesus, is a story about a king who invites people to a wedding feast, to a big dinner. So, um, so all of us kind of understand this. You can't get to a wedding, you're not supposed to get into a wedding without an invitation. There are crashers sometimes, but you're not supposed to go. It's important, you have to know the bride, you have to know the groom, they have to say, hey, you're invited, come and celebrate with us. How many of you guys have been recently married? You're recently married in here, right? Okay, like five people, all right? You guys know about invitations. How many of you getting ready to get married? Uh, you, you're starting to figure out some stuff about uh, invitation. Have you, how many of you have ever been to a wedding? Okay, there you go. All right, I thought we'd get some participation there. Before you went to that wedding, you got an invitation. You know how this game works today. It's very, very complex, way different than it was back in the 1900s. It begins with the save the date something. Save the date postcards, very hip. Everybody's doing it, right? And it's a picture of the couple dressed as they would never normally dress in a location they would never normally be doing something they never would normally do, right? So you've, you've, you've seen all this. You know, the couple's out in some country, you know, they're swinging on a tire swing on a tree. And you know the, di the guy's just dying. Seriously, I'm pushing my wife on a, on a tire swing. Or they're walking down an old lane in the country. And they don't live in the country. They just found this abandoned lane and they're hoping the farmer doesn't show up. But they're taking pictures in the old lane. Or their uh, they're, they're pants rolled up standing in a, co a fountain you know, kicking water at each other, which is never going to happen ever again in your life. But I like the photos. That's great. What I'd like to see, since we live in central Illinois, just one time, is a save-the-date invitation where the girl's hair is blowing out of control in sideways freezing rain. <laughs> with the groom's pants splatted with road slush, trying to cover her with a blown-up umbrella, and the bride-to-be is in mid-scold because it's his fault that it's raining like this, right? <laughs> That's real. Save the date for that wedding. I'm going. That's realistic. Well, you guys know that after the save the date, the formal invitation comes. It's very official. It's very fancy. It's fancy paper. It all matches. And, and you have to sit down at some point and decide who you're inviting to the wedding. Who's coming? Right? You start with family, her family, his family. Then you start inviting people that you want to invite, friends of yours. Then you start inviting people that you should invite right? Because you have to. Then you invite family that you should invite. And, uh, and then you invite people who you know can't come, but they're probably going to give you a good gift. So you invite them too, right? And you go through this whole process of, of thinking who should be at this wedding and who you want to have at this wedding. And, um, and that's what today's sermon is all. The, the wedding invitation has changed in 2,000 years. It's a little different culturally. Things have changed, and we don't live in the Eastern peoples where this story was told first, but a wedding invitation is still a big deal. And uh, today we're going to read about one that's very special from Matthew 22. We're continuing this Kingdom of Heaven, these stories, Kingdom Stories series, and here's another story that Jesus tells us in chapter 22 of Matthew, starting with verse 1. Here's the word of the Lord, most important thing you're going to hear today. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. 
Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business. And while the rest of them seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops, and he destroyed the murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, well, the wedding feast is still ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him out into the outer darkness in that place where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For, here it is, many are called, a few are chosen. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us today about this wedding invitation. God, would you come in this place now? I've sensed your Holy Spirit's presence in our laughter, in our um, kind of illustrating the marriage wedding feast of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and, and wearing tuxes and ties and singing praises to you, God. I, your Spirit's stirring. I pray it continues to stir now at the preaching of your word, that as we lift up the name Jesus, the Holy Spirit will just move in every heart here. God, would you not let anybody get away today without hearing clearly the invitation, whether they're online, whether they're here, new or old. I pray, Father, that you would move and do what only you can do. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Remember, Jesus is explaining the kingdom of heaven. That's why he says in verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, and then he tells another story. And I love how Jesus does this. If you haven't caught on this, he's just telling regular stories. If you were sitting there at the first century and you started hearing him talk about a wedding and a king, you'd go, oh, I get it. This brings it down to my real life place, right? And so Jesus begins this wedding story, not just any wedding story. It's a wedding that's thrown by a king. He's got power, he sits on a throne, he has wealth, and he's doing it in honor of his son, to celebrate the marriage of his son. It's a big deal, the king invites many people to celebrate him, all right? And so it, it, again, I'm just gonna kinda throw in some first century wedding traditions along the way so we kinda understand this differently, because they do it differently than us. If, if we're lucky, we get a four or five or six, if it's way too long, seven hour kinda reception after the wedding, right? Uh, in the first century, weddings were at least a week-long celebration. And sometimes they lasted up to two weeks. You would just celebrate and feast. And so this feast in the first century that lasted longer than a week. So think of this guy, this king, this generous king is preparing a feast, a week-long buffet. Right? He's going to make sure everybody has plenty because he wants them to enjoy this incredible feast. Back in the 1900s when Sarah and I got married... Uh, there wasn't quite as much preparation as this for our reception. I think it lasted about two hours. It consisted of, you know, in the olden days, you, you younger people are going to laugh, but we had, we had mints and mixed nuts and punch and cake. <laughs> our entire wedding cost us $500. The whole wedding. The whole wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Those are parents clapping who have paid for weddings. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so cheap anymore. But the preparation for uh, today even has gotten more complicated than that. You have to find a venue, and you have to find the menu, and you have to figure out who's going to come, and uh, the DJ, and the music, and how you want that whole party to last. It's only five or six hours, but it costs now thousands of dollars. Now, I want you to think now, if you were a king in the first century, what kind of party might you throw? He gives us some indication here. He's prepared. He says in verse 4, I've prepared my dinner. I'm ready. Look at this. He, he slaughtered his oxen and his fat calves, right? This one line hints at both the wealth and the generosity of the king. He's holding nothing back for his son. It's plural oxen. It's plural, right, calves. He is, he's, he's, making, he's putting on a feast, and he's, he's killing all of his animals so that everybody can have steak. I'm sure that's what he's serving, right? Because this is a godly sermon, right? <laughs> but the first century currency that he has is, is his, his possessions, his, his, um, his cattle, his, his sheep. He's preparing all of it. If you really want to be astounded, go to the Old Testament and read the, the amount of food that Solomon prepared in one day 
for everybody that lived in his palace. You can get an idea. Be, beyond the meat, he had to have cheeses and skins of wine and fruits and entertainment and music and dancing. He's preparing a week-long buffet for us to party in the name of his son and enjoy this great celebration of his son being married. He, he's going to give all the wealth of his kingdom so that it will be the party of a lifetime. Guys, you don't have to squint too hard to find out that the King Jesus, the King that Jesus is talking about here is the Father God. And he's throwing a feast for his son, Jesus Christ. And we'll get to more of that in just a moment. And, and he's ready for it. See, I've prepared, he says, verse four, everything is ready. I, I think this indicates that the king is kind of involved. He's not just turning this over to some people to organize this. He said, no, no, I, wanna, I want the details to be right. I want my son to be honored. I want people to have, they can't walk away from this party going, oh, that wasn't too good. It's got to be the most awesome thing that ever happened. And he's got prepared and it's ready. We can only imagine how he coordinated the details. So this is God making preparations for those of us he's invited in honor of and through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how we're supposed to read this. Okay. By the way, um, if you just pay attention to some of the language in the New Testament, like John 14, we know this famous passage, I go to prepare a place for you. Same preparation word as the one in this wedding. It's, it's wedding language. I'm going to go and prepare a place. Jesus and God are working right now on this incredible feast. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, that eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Y'all, listen, this is going to be a party. It is going to be, that's totally 80. Party on, dudes. All right. Uh, I don't know what's happening in my brain right now, but forgive me. So I'm borrowed time, really. There's a king that's preparing a feast and he wants us to be there. Culturally, an invitation to a wedding feast in the first century would be something you'd say yes to, even if you didn't want to go because you didn't want to insult the people in town. You just say yes out of courtesy. Nobody, nobody turned down an invitation to a wedding in the first century. And definitely, you would not pass up a chance to hang out with the king. It would be both an honor and an obligation. But I want you to see that people are invited and they don't come. In verse 3, he, he, say, he calls those who were invited, but they would not come. In verse 4, he sends other servants, tell those who were invited to come, but they, were, they paid no attention. They went off to their farm and to their business, and still some others, uh, they, they kill the, the servants that were sent to invite them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But even after all that hubbub happens, this crazy war in the middle of the ceremony happens. Then he sends out more in verse 9. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. What point am I trying to make? I'm trying to make this point. There is a king who's throwing an amazing party that's going to be eternal, and he's inviting you. Amen. He's an invitation king. It's going to be great. Don't turn this down. Don't miss this. Come. Everything is ready. And so he invites. In fact, the word invited in the ESV and the word call in the ESV is six times in this passage. I, I just want to say it for emphasis. Come, 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 come. Is that five? Come. He wants you to be there. There's a king that's inviting us into something amazing. It's a parable that he's telling, but he's pointing us to a picture of an eternal kingdom of heaven. You can't read about a wedding feast prepared for a son without immediately going to Revelation 19. I've got the references there for you in your notes if you're following along. But in Revelation 19, this is a picture of eternity. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The bride is the church. Blessed, listen, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're blessed because you're invited. And the king goes to great lengths to make sure that you will be there. I want you to, I want you to hear the generosity and the persistent invitation of this king. And if you're not a Christ follower today, I'm appealing to you like these servants the king sent out. I'm not the king I didn't organize the wedding. I don't have inside information. I'm just telling you what I know. The king has said, if you want to, you can come. And if you're watching today online or you're visiting here and you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, if you want to, 
you're invited. The king wants me to tell you, come to the wedding feast. All things are prepared. Many are called, and you are the many who have been called. Wow, what an incredible thing. Unfortunately, there's this last line here that says, many are called and few are chosen. I'm asking you this question today. Are you going to go? You know, sometimes when you get uh, wedding invitations, you compare them with friends. I, I don't know. You going? I'm going. Yeah, I think we're going. Is the whole family going? Who's going? Man, and this is a good place for us to ask it today since we're in church and we've sung some Jesus songs and we're going to celebrate communion together and we're all dressed up. We might as well ask the question, are you going? Yeah. Are you going? Yeah. I'm going. If you're going, and the reason I ask if you're going, because believe it or not, not everybody says yes to the king's invitation. <laughs> Seriously. I know why I skipped some of the weddings that I skipped today. That's easy, right? But the king is inviting us into a special place and a special celebration. Many of us are called. And biblically, when you hear the, the word chosen, because he says many Many are called, but few are chosen. When you hear that word chosen, you've got to think of the Old Testament people of God because they were the chosen people of God. From Abraham and the promise on, I'm going to bless you to bless all nations. He chose the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, right? And so I want to give you a little context here because it's important for us to really understand these stories that Jesus tells. Um, this is a picture of the Southern Steps. We're going to be there in about eight days with another group uh, of East viewers, about 50 of us going over there. Uh, these, these are the Southern Steps of the, um, the temple complex. They are 2,000 years old. I'm standing, we are sitting where Jesus sat and stood. And this place is where um, Jesus would teach the masses. You can't really see the breadth and the depth of this, but this is about a one-third of the steps. Right? So it goes all the way across here. You can see that our group is taking up, you know, about 50 or 60 of us in that place. I want you to understand that as Jesus taught in the, te in the temple area, he was probably on these southern steps because it's the place where the common people could go. It's the place that if you, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't holy enough to go in the temple and, the, and be like a priest and stuff, you could, you could stand here and Jesus could teach. I want you also to understand that when he's teaching this sermon, he's telling his story right now, he's days away from being crucified, okay? So he's already had his triumphant in entry. They've all already sang Hosanna, but it's, it's a couple days before he's gonna be killed. Now, I want you to just picture in your mind, I'm gonna, these poor people, they don't know who we are. They're another group, but they're gonna be the Pharisees today, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and the reason they're Pharisees is because I picture the Pharisees just kind of standing over here at the side, listening to Jesus' sermon. And uh, in fact, if you want to back up in your scriptures a little bit, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. They're eavesdropping on, what is he saying? Oh, he's talking about us. And you know what? They were right. He was talking about them because they were the Jewish leaders. They're the ones responsible for the people of God in the first century and teaching them about the coming Messiah. But these religious leaders, um, they perceived he was speaking about him because he was saying, listen, you guys are Jewish people by, by, by birth and by tradition, and you're the leaders of the Jewish people. But guess what? You've been invited. You've been invited, but you're not going to get in because you're ignoring all the signs. Those invited and not coming to the feast are first Israel, the nation that God picked in the Old Testament descendants of Abraham, but they've rejected God's invitation by rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. I, again, you might have to say, why would anybody ever be invited to the super cool wedding feast and not go? Well, there's four reasons we find in this passage. According to Jesus, some people just don't wanna come. Some are called, they just don't want to. That's the word there in verse three. It's the Greek word that means to will or to want to desire. This is it. They don't, don't, they don't give an excuse. They don't say, hey, guys, the wedding feast is ready, but they would not come. Some people just don't want to come to Jesus' feast. Some people just don't want to be a part of what God's doing. Historically, the Jewish people of God, though they were chosen, they rejected God's invitation to be his people. Even these first century leaders did not want to listen to Jesus' teaching. And in fact, this, after this parable is over, they're going to start plotting on how they're going to kill him. And they're going to be successful within three days. 
And so these first century leaders, they didn't want to listen to Jesus' teaching. They didn't want to believe him as the Messiah. And so they just ignored him. And still today, we live in a culture. Maybe some of you, I hope not some of you in here, some watching online who are going, I just don't get it, and I don't buy it, and I'm not in. I'm not going. And, and as much as I, I just can't believe that anybody would say that, but it's true. Some people are invited, they're just not coming. And um, Jesus says there's others that um, they're not just coming, they don't care enough to come. Verse 5, see what happens here. Verse 5 says they paid no attention. They went and paid attention to their farm. They went and paid attention to their business, but they paid no attention to the invitation. Again, the Greek language helps us understand that this word paying no attention means to be careless or to care less. And uh, here's the invitation from the king. You should be honored. You should be obligated. You should be excited. It's going to be the biggest bash ever. And you're invited. You are invited. But you know what? I, I don't care enough about that. I care about some other stuff I got going on. Some people are going to miss the kingdom of God because they care about other stuff. They care about their farm. They care about their business. They care about their family. They put something in the way of Jesus' invitation. See, these, these religious leaders that we're talking about, these Pharisees, you know that one group sitting over there in the corner? Um, they, they understood the scriptures. They were busy actually being godly people. In fact, they were probably some of the most righteous people you ever meet in your life. But what does Jesus tell us? Remember on the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew 5, 20? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you're not getting in the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't want you to be busy and have a bunch of knowledge about me. I want you to come hang out with me. I want you to come to the wedding feast. And the Pharisees refused to get rid of their religion and embrace Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some today are just too busy and concerned with other things to come to what God is offering. And this, this um, if you paid attention as I was reading this, this story gets even more bizarre and tragic. Some people just go, I don't have to come. I know you're the king. I know this is a big deal, but you're not the boss of me. I'm not coming. In, in fact, they get so excited about it, they get so, so you know, riled up about it, they end up killing the servants. Look in verse 6. They treat them shamefully, they grab them, literally seize them, and they kill them. Wow, didn't see that coming from a wedding invitation. You ever get invited to a wedding and go, if they invite me again, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> Nobody says that, nobody does that. What are the craziest thinking in the world that you're going to kill somebody because they invite you to the best celebration in the history of the world? Why would these servants do this? But, but again, remember, he's telling us an earthly story to point out what's happened spiritually throughout the years. God has been inviting the children of Israel in the Old Testament constantly, come, come, follow my ways, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I'll protect you, I'll guide you, I'll lead you, I'm with you. Come, 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 have a relationship with me. And what did God's Old Testament people do over and over and over again? Nope, going to do it our way. Nope, going to go our way. Nope, not going to listen. So he sent prophets, and he sent priests, and he sent lawgivers, and he sent messengers, and he sent angels. You know what they tried to do? Kill them. That's the story Jesus is telling. The Pharisees are not dumb. They're going, oh, we get this. You're talking about our history. We, we've, we've been invited to this feast and we have end up killing. In fact, this crazy murder in the middle of the wedding feast is exactly what the religious leaders of God's people are going to do in about three days. And they've done it all through the history of the people of God and God's calling them. In a few short days, they're going to kill Jesus. And so while this story seems overly dramatic, um, he's making a point about what's going on historically. And you have to understand, if, if you're in the first century and Jesus says, hey, this king's throwing a party, and the people say, no, we're not coming, they go, what? And then when Jesus tells the story, he says, he invited them again, and they said, no, we got other stuff to do, they would go, what? And then when he said, no, this is this last time, they, they killed the servants who were delivering the invitations, people would go, that's crazy. They, the, the people would, would beat everybody to the punch. They would say, they deserve to die. And that's exactly what happens in the middle of this wedding. Again, it's not a real story, so you can't imagine a king's going, well, the, I'm going to leave the reception for a couple hours, go kill a bunch of people, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. But he's trying to illustrate the kingdom of God. 
And so what happens is, is he goes and he brings judgment on the people, the people who took the lives of his servants. Guys, uh, Jesus is polarizing. He just is. Jesus doesn't come and say, hey, you know what? You can believe in me or Muhammad or Buddha or any number of Hindu gods or your own way or your grandpa or anything that you think. You, if you do that, that's cool. You're getting the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say that. Jesus necessarily is polarizing because he goes, hey, if you want to go to God, it's me. That's your only way. That's it. And it just makes some people mad. <laughs> they just, you, you can't imagine people getting mad to be invited to a wedding feast that's going to be the best ever in the history of the world. But they do because Jesus is so polarizing by saying, I'm the way. Here's what you need to understand. God has gone to great lengths to relentlessly invite all of us to come. He's paid the price through his son, Jesus Christ, and he's inviting you in today. In eternity, in eternity future, Nobody here that's listening to me right now or online is going to be able to say, I didn't know I was invited. You're invited. You're invited. Some people will reject Jesus and they will become enemies of Jesus because they don't want to go to the feast. And here's the bad news. If you declare enmity against the king, you will face the wrath of the king. Just the way it is. I'm not happy to tell you that. But um, if you're not going to come to the constant invitation of the king and you, you lash out against him, he's going to bring judgment there. There's one other judgment piece of this story that I think is super bizarre, if you didn't catch it in verses 11 and 12. It's just bizarre. Jesus goes, he goes, okay, uh, God as the Father is going, okay, uh, you know, all the people that were invited, they weren't worthy. So I'm still going to have this wedding feast because it's still my son and it's still awesome and I've killed all these cows and stuff anyhow, so let's go. Let's go get some people. And then he sends his servants out into the highways. This is where just the normal people would pass or stand in the road. And you see in this, in this story, it says in verse 11, look, both good and bad were invited. Now, if you're a deep Bible scholar or super smart guy or gal that studies the Bible, you would divide this story possibly into two sections. The first three invites were to the children of Israel, the Old Testament people of God. Now we're moving into the Gentile world, the church, non-Jewish people, me and you, most of us. And he goes, okay, the, the Jews rejected me. I'm going to go out into the streets. The people are not the people of God. I'm going to bring them in. So he invites in both the good and bad. And, um, but here's the deal. There's, a la there's another reason that you're, not gonna you're going to be invited to the feast and maybe even get into the feast, but you're not staying. And that's if you're not dressed right. If you're not dressed appropriately. The, the, the refrain of this guy is, I'll come as I want. Now, some history will help us here with, the, with first century weddings. Um, if you were rich or a king, it's very possible that you actually would buy garments, wedding garments, for everybody in the party and say, hey, wear this. It's kind of like bridesmaids saying, here are the dresses we're wearing, right? Or the bride saying that to her bridesmaids. This is the way we're going to dress. Sometimes a rich person in the first century would go, hey, come to my wedding and wear this. It's a very special robe. It matches. I want everybody to look the same and clean and all that stuff. That's possible. The other possibility is this guy's in the wedding feast, not dressed appropriately because he just didn't clean himself up. He just said, well, I'm a bad guy on the road. I'm going to go to this wedding feast. And even the poorest of people would clean themselves up, would go and change and shower, pour oil and perfume on themselves and try to present themselves in the best light when they go to the king's wedding feast. If you don't believe this is true, I've been in some of the most impoverished places in the world to worship. When you go to church on a Sunday morning in Haiti, they are dressed better than I'm dressed right now. You go to church in, in, in Africa, where we've been over there in Kenya, they dress. You, these people who live in slums, they come out looking nice. Because that's what you do when you're invited to something special. When you're invited to the king's wedding, all of us can clean up a little bit. Jesus comes to this man and he says, Why, how did you get in here? How did you get here? Not, you're not dressed for a wedding. And, and here's the, the indication of the man's guilt. Look what it says. He, he, did, he was silent. He had nothing to say, no defense. And Jesus says, you can't stay here. He was speechless. You can't stay here. See, everyone is invited to Jesus as you are, good or bad. But if you can't come to the feast in the kingdom of this king and stay the way that you are. I, I want us to get this point. It's very, very crucial. And Jesus calls everyone. I love the fact that the good and bad were invited in. 
Because I'm the bad. If I understand myself and my human reality and my past and my sins and my life, I'm the bad guy standing on the street corner, and the king says, come in. But the king never says, and this is something we got to get right in this culture, the king never says, come in and just stay the way you are. This is true. Listen to me. I'm telling you good news today. No matter who you are, he loves, Jesus loves everyone. He accepts everyone. He touches the unlovely, the unloved, the unlovable. He died for the outsiders and the prostitutes and the sinners and the orphans and the widows. He died for the the diminished, the desperate, and the downtrodden. He's the hero of the underdog. Jesus loves everyone, and he invites everyone to come in. But y'all, he loves us too much to, to let us stay where we're at. He wants to call us in for change. He calls us from the street corner to the palace. He calls us from nothing to do to I'm going to a feast. He calls us from no purpose, just hanging out on the road to we're going to be sons and daughters of the king. He calls us from the rags of our sin to the riches of his robes and eternity with him. Guys, you can't get excited about the change that God wants to make in your life. You're probably not worthy of the feast that he's throwing. He wants to change you, and he can change you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So there's three takeaways I want us to focus on today. It's another kingdom story. You're sitting there going, well, tomorrow I got to go to work or school or whatever I'm going off to. Home is home, and my family is my family, and lunch is lunch, and so who cares? Well, let me give you three takeaways from this story that I think are very important to us. Um, what we need to know today. The first is this, the chosen of chosen. You you look at that word down there, many are called but few are chosen, and some of you might want to throw up a hand to God and say, it's not fair, not everybody's chosen. Because the word literally does mean to choose, it means to pick. Like we're picking teams, I choose you, 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 you. And here's the thing, the sovereignty of God cannot be taken away. He is the king, and he knows all things, and he sees all things, and he knows who's eventually going to end up at the feast. Cannot take the sovereignty of God away. But I want you to see in this story that the sovereignty of God plays in conjunction with the faith and obedience of those who are called. Okay, that, that those who are called, those who are invited, have to make a choice. Will I go or will I not go? And that choice we call faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your RSVP that you're coming to this feast. We don't fully understand how God chooses us, but we get to choose. And I can't explain it to you because it's deeper theology than I can understand. I suppose we'll get to heaven someday and we'll go, ah, yeah, yeah. and get it now. But for right now, I want you to understand, don't think that God's just chosen you to be out or in. He's inviting you, and you get to choose whether you're going to follow him by faith and obedience. The second thing I want us to think about is there's only one way to be worthy. Did you see that that phrase there? Those that were invited first in verse 8 were not worthy. They didn't deserve it. They don't belong around a king's table at a wedding feast for a son that's so, uh, you know, so great. So um, this has to do with how we dress at the wedding feast. And since the rebellion in the garden of the people uh, that were in the world, Adam and Eve, from the very beginning of rebellion, once they sinned, Jesus, God, has spent time clothing people's nakedness and sin. He clothed them with skins. And if you fast forward all through the Old Testament, Isaiah 61 talks about what God does through us in salvation. He's clothed me with garments of salvation, a robe of righteousness. Galatians says those who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed in Jesus Christ. Revelation 7 pictures those in heaven whose robes are white. How are they white? They're washed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the only way you're going to be dressed appropriately and worthy in the kingdom of God. But he wants to make you worthy. He wants to clothe you, cover up your sin. The third takeaway I think is really important. I just want to say it one more time. The invitation remains. The eternal feast hasn't begun yet. There's still time. And the king is still going out into the highways and the roads, and he's searching for good and bad. Anybody who will just say, I'll come and I'll honor your son. And some of us, frankly, are ready for the wedding feast to begin because we found this world not to be that great. 
Others have life ahead of them and they're wondering what's taken this, the Lord so long. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord's not slow in fulfilling his promises as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So the invitation remains, don't get hung up on called, chosen. Here's what I know, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins so that you could come. And I want you to hear this today, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying to you, come, for all things are now ready. I've prepared, I've paid the price, I've bought you the clothing, come. Amen.